Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me today, and uh, welcome to Live from My Drum Room. My guest today is my old friend, and, and I do mean old friend, meaning a long, from a long time ago, uh, Russ Miller. Uh, great session player, educator, author, um, and drum uh, innovator, drum design innovator, which we'll talk about all those things today. So I appreciate you folks tuning in on this Sunday afternoon. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Okay, good. I'm, I'm seeing some, some familiar faces watching today. So thank you for being here. I'm um, going to take a couple of quick moments here and thank you all for tuning in this past week for my show with David Frangioni, CEO and publisher of Modern Drummer Magazine, the new home of Live from My Drum Room. And uh, that episode that I did with David this past week will air, will we'll drop this coming Thursday, um, March 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. You'll be able to watch that on YouTube, and you'll be able to download the podcast. And in the meantime, don't forget, my episode with Joe Franco uh, from a week before that is now live on the MD YouTube channel, and you can also download the podcast for that on MD's Podcast One uh, platform. And... Uh, if you need any help, I can give you all the links for all those places. So again, thank you for tuning in today with my uh, my good friend, Russ Miller. And um, last bit of info is just to let you know that this Wednesday, if you haven't already seen it advertised, this Wednesday, the 23rd of March at 1 p.m. Eastern time, my guest will be none other than Tommy Igo my old pal, Tommy Igo, the great Tommy Igo. So don't miss that this coming Wednesday, March 23rd, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Okay. Whew. I know that's a lot of announcements. So everybody repeat those announcements back to me. So I know you got them. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, going to get right down to business here today because Russ is, uh, Russ is waiting patiently in the green room. So I don't want to keep them waiting too long. Thank you all for watching. And uh, without any further ado, please welcome my old pal, <laughs> Russ Miller. What's up, Johnny? Good to see you, Russ. You know, I was I was going to introduce you as Michael McDonald. That, that That's, you know, <laughs> I went for Michael McDonald. It came out more Sean Connery. <laughs> you know, I didn't think of that. <laughs> can, you, can you do a Sean Connery? Do you do like a? Yeah, uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. He would do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, I don't know what happened. You know what? They used to make me diet when I was on American Idol, and I got mad when I when I, when I left the show. So I was like, I'm not dieting anymore. I and think you told it. me that. Now that you say that, wow. Well, that's that's a good bit of info for the the folks watching out there to hear, man. <laughs> Well, it's not like you who seemingly is reversing in age at every moment. As I, as I look at you, you're getting younger. Not true, buddy. Thank you for saying that. But <laughs> as I say, you know, if you see me in the profile, you'll see it's... Yeah, you're catching up. There you go. I'm you go. catching up. Yeah. But that, you know, I, I was kidding about Michael McDonald because that really, you look, you look fantastic. That suits so, you perfectly. Yeah. So. Thanks. My wife loves it. I, I don't know. Every time I look in the mirror, I'm like, who is that guy? But I did talk Zuckerman and Rich Redmond into letting it go. So they're 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 joining the crowd. Yeah, you know? I good. Well, when I see Todd, you know Todd's um, goatee and many, you know, you'll see it's definitely his natural. Um, yeah, yeah, his natural color. So <clears throat> yeah, I have a lot of friends, but you know, it's the Nam thing. You know, when you would see the guy who's like. 67 years old and he walks in with jet black hair <laughs> like, it's just like you're just going oh, i know i know just let it go baby i like, know i know and to anybody watching who dyes their hair we, we <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> my throat's dry already it's from all the <laughs> laughing um to anybody watching at home that dyes your hair it's okay you can do that We're it's, not okay. it's okay yeah it's okay yeah yeah, no. yeah. just but, you know, admit it, though. You can't, <laughs> you can't pre pretend like we're all pretending together. Like, no, no, it looks totally natural. Uh, I feel like I'm having a conversation with Steve Smith because this is the kind of stuff, Steve, you know, we'll just get into this. He'll go, you know, yeah. exactly. Yeah. These guys. 
I just talked to Steve. We just had a um, a jazz swing drummers roundtable for Groove X, and it was um, Jeff Hamilton, Peter Erskine, Adam Nussbaum, Steve Smith, and I. And um, I don't know why I was there. I maybe don't well. I had the ability to maybe set their drums up, but it uh, pretty much no. stops there. And uh, it was fun though. We had we laughed more than we talked about anything until Peter cut us off at the end, going, "We sound like a bunch of grumpy old guys." <laughs> <laughs> and Nuss Bomb goes, "We are a bunch of grumpy old guys." Oh yeah. my God! What what a group! What a group of guys that is, man! A group of drummers. oh man, yeah, really amazing gems of information too. You know. Yeah. to get them going once you get them going so it and was fun anytime you have peter jeff hamilton and adam nussbaum in the same group yeah um, there's no way you you can't be laughing like 90 percent of the time with oh my gosh yeah. I, we have a lot of fun we've done a lot of stuff together over the years and so just playing on festivals together or you know i was playing with an actor they were playing with an actor and we hang in europe or whatever and just it's great it's great. Like you, we've known each other for, I don't know how long, long time. We've known each other. Well, I, by my recollection, Russ, since 1990, 32 years, right? I mean, yeah, I think- because actually this is my 30th plus year as a Zildjian artist. So, and you brought me in there. So yeah, I, I, I recall, be- yeah, I, I recall it being, I started in 89 and I think it was maybe the spring or I, I remember you coming to the factory, coming up to Boston. You were living in Miami. That's right. And, and I think it might have been, um, we had recently sort of picked up the um, Ron Tunk's sales rep agency to, Correct. to rep right. Zildjian. Yeah, and I think right. Bert or Ron or one of the guys, one of the Tunk's guys. Yeah, Ron, yeah. Ron recommended you. And we got, we and I got together on the phone and then you made a trip up to Boston and and then at the same time, I'll just say at the same time, I think you had, you had signed with Yamaha before that, I think, mm-hmm. because yeah. you were recommended by, by Hagi. And at that time, um, was Edelson still with Yamaha? Maybe yeah. Must have been. Yeah, yeah. Steve was with them. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Steve signed me to Yamaha under Hagi and to Remo. <laughs> cause then he went to Remo just That's after right. that. And That's then, right. yeah. yeah. And then he went to Evans for a minute. And, and then if you remember, ironically he was going to mapex I do when he passed that. away he had got and then joe hibbs got his job because steve passed away at mapex and then joe brought me to mapex so i, I know i many years later but yeah i saw well you know rest rest his soul rest in peace steve edelson i i remember him telling me um at the md fest that may of 2001 it was the year i got married it was like a month before i got married and he said to me uh yeah i'm, I'm, I'm moving to nashville and it's going to be a bit of a change but it's cool man i'm ready f- i'm ready for change and and he was excited about it yeah yeah and then he was gone a couple of weeks later in early june of right yeah that was a crazy crazy story crazy time but yeah, yeah. it was it was kind of interesting how he trailed steve there for a minute. yeah you did you did i'll just tell you one more thing about steve man he was you know i i know you loved him and i loved him and yeah. um he left me a voicemail i remember um probably like a week after the md festival <clears throat> he called me about something and it was maybe even after hours left a voicemail and he's and he but we had had we had sat together at the at the md banquet that year so we had we really hung and talked a lot and i was so happy for him and he said uh and I, just the last thing he said in his message was and man congratulations on the wedding you're gonna look great in that wedding gown you know <laughs> typical edelson like totally you know, yeah, yeah humor. <laughs> and i just remember like i wish i could have kept that voicemail you know but um you know if you remember the thing about steve that was and this this is kind of gone by gone era now was his little black restaurant book do you remember that? And he had like, no matter where you were at on the planet Earth, he had like the hang, wherever it was going to be. Like, yeah. you know, and we would call him and go, hey, I'm in, you know, <laughs> Madagascar. Where is the yeah. place? <laughs> you know? He was like, like, oh, there's an Indian spot. You know, you got to hear it. Concierge service. Yeah, I know. I know. He, um, well, I tell you, the, I remember 
perfectly what you're saying. A great example. The first time I went to Montreal Drum Fest in like 94 and Steve was there and I remember we were like, he'd got there the day before me because it was such a short flight up from Boston. I like flew up on the Saturday morning and he right. got in like on Friday night. So I get to the, I get to the venue and I see Steve and I think the first thing he said is, I got, I got a restaurant for us tonight. <laughs> I found, I found an Italian place like right up. The street. Yeah, can, yeah. I got some pasta. Yeah. We're in Montreal. I'm like, this, they don't do that here really. <laughs> Well, we this was like yeah. our spot for like thirty years or twenty yeah. twenty some odd years after that. But but Steve, I remember him going like, I found us, I found our spot like tonight. <laughs> and it's so, <laughs> oh man! And you know what's so funny? Because when I moved to I I when I moved to L. A. I lived in a you know this story. I lived in a yeah. storage closet in Third Encore, and the reason that I lived in the storage, I lived in, I was in the closet for years. No, I, I lived in the storage closet. I moved to LA and Edelson had his office at third encore. That's and so did Carol, Carol Collado. So Carol, will tell you this story too. But, she, uh, but so Carol and Steve were in this building at, at third encore, which is a, for everybody, it's like a high end rehearsal facility. You know, everybody rehearses there from the Rolling Stones to whoever. And everybody, they would have these big closets where they, or storage thing where they would put all the flight cases. So they would, and a lot of people kept their gear there so they could just pull it out and rehearse, roll it down the hall and rehearse and then put it on the trucks and then go and then bring it back. And so I moved to LA. I had 2000 bucks in my pocket and my, my red Ford Econoline van with, you know, some CDs, clothes and some drums. And, and Edelson was like, listen, Bear, the guy that owns Third Encore, don't tell him, but I'm going to let you rent one of these spots, you know, and then you can put all your stuff in there. And if you got to stay in every once in a while, it's cool, you know, so he he hooked me up with my closet <laughs> at Third oh, Encore, yeah. and I lived in there. It was eight by 10. I lived in there for 13 months, and I joined Gold's Gym so I could go shower because there was no shower or anything. There was just a toilet, of course, it was disgusting. <laughs> but, you know, I would go, you know, that was it. I would go to the, the gym to, to shower in the morning and whatever. And I had like a little hot plate and a microwave and my drums. And like, there wasn't really any internet yet, but I, I called the phone company and was like, I need to get a phone line. And they're like, where do you want it? And I'm like, well, in this closet, <laughs> I remember the phone guy going, the hell do you want a phone line in the closet for? And I'm like, oh, you know, we work in here a lot. We want to call, you know, and uh, and it, it allowed me to have like a fax machine. <laughs> you remember? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And that was it. And and he had his office in there and I lived in there for 13 months and we would hang like wow. so much, you know, until I got the gig with the fifth dimension. And um who Hal recommended me for? Hal Blaine. Yeah. Wow, and, uh, fantastic. Yeah, and this was in I don't know what year, maybe two thousand three or something, and four maybe. And um, and then once I got the gig with the Fifth Dimension, I could afford to like get an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. My, yeah, that's great. Yeah. I didn't know Steve Edelson hooked you up with the with the. Uh, I knew you had that yeah. living situation. Yeah. Yeah, wow. he's the guy that hooked that because they were at. The Yamaha Artist Relations office was at Third Encore. So he was, yeah. yeah, and Carol's office was there too. So she always laughs about it now when I talk to Carol about it. Yeah. To think that I probably spoke with you on the phone many times while you were in the closet. In the closet. Just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking you're in your fancy LA pad, you know, but. No, no, there was that. Was, there was no fancy LA pad for many years later. That was. <laughs> Yeah, that was for sure. Oh man! Well, there, I want to quickly say hello to, to Los Carlos Guzman, who's who's in the house as he always is. Yes. And big hello to Los, and also Anthony Casina um, is asking. He's he's a he's a frequent watcher here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Anthony, and he's asking if you could talk about changing where the pulse is developed from your hands and feet to more internally and mentally. Wow. Maybe we'll get to that in a minute. I, I wanted to I wanted yeah. to just kind of pick your brain on a couple more things, but we'll come back to that sure. question, Anthony. That's sure. a great question. Good question. Yeah. Um, Cause we, you know, we'll talk about drum technique too. We won't talk about yeah. fancy cars and stuff like that all the whole time. But um, all right. so, so you, you grew up in Ohio. I, I remembered 
when I met you, you told me you'd moved, you know, grown up in Ohio. And when did you move to Miami? To go to school, to okay. University of Miami when I was 19. Yeah. 19. Okay. Yeah. And then, and you stayed there after that, obviously. And you. Yeah, I, I stayed to work with, I was, you know, I started my studio career there. Yeah. And um, I had, uh, you know, I was doing a ton of gigs, just local gigs and stuff. And then the whole Gloria Estefan camp, you know, that whole camp was there. And so I started to work with a lot of those people from that camp. And then other artists like Raul de Blasio, who was like a really famous Afro-Cuban artist, or uh, there was all the guys that were doing sessions that were a part of the BG stuff and, and Julio Iglesias. So there was that was way before the Ricky Martins and the Shakiras and stuff. So that cr that crowd from Gloria and Julio and 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 um, a couple other artists, the Bee Gees, that crowd was the working crowd there. So I was studying with Steve Rucker, who was playing with the Bee Gees at the right. time. Okay. And you know, so I just. I was working a lot, you know, like doing a lot of stuff, touring a little bit. And then there was some local artists that were doing really well in the smooth jazz scene. And I was playing with those guys. So we were playing all these big festivals and doing all this stuff and, and starting to do albums and things. But, you know, I, I always wanted to be a session guy. And my heroes were, you know, Gad and Picaro and J.R. Robinson and Carlos Vega and, you know, all, all these guys that... I loved being in the studio and I knew that I couldn't do that for my, that, that there was a very limited scene there. There was a scene back then, but it was limited to those camps. Yep. You know what I mean? So it was great working with all those guys. It was just, I knew that it was like those two or three, four little camps of people. And then that was it. So I, I needed to go to New York or, or LA to really expand it in a grand way. Yeah. No, that, that, you were smart to do that. I mean, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you could have stayed in Miami and made a great living and, yeah. and been, you know, the, the, the big fish in the smaller pond, so to speak there. But cause I remember, I remember when you made the move to LA and I, not that I wasn't surprised, but I remembered you were doing well in Miami, Yeah. but it made sense that you were ready to sort of now. Well, yeah, to, it was to, very to conscious. Finish. It was, yeah. And to be honest, I had a nice house and everything in Miami, like it was, I had it set, you know, and I literally, there was, the only reason to leave was ambition. There was yeah. no other reason to leave. I could have stayed there easily. And a lot of my friends who did stay there, they've done well. They're, you know, they're yeah. fine. Richie yeah. Bravo and Lee Levin and, you know, that those guys have maintained really well in that circle. But I just, I knew that if I wanted to do what I wanted to do on a grand scale, that I needed to go to LA to do it or New York, but I, you mentioned Ohio. I was like, I literally was like, I can't do the weather. <laughs> I just can't do it. I grew up in Ohio. I was in Miami. I'm like, I just can't go back. I can't go back to like yeah. the cold weather. I'm going to LA, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Going, and, yeah. and and how, how old were you when you moved to LA? 24. 24. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. And, and, how like you mentioned you know that living at third encore for that first year or so and but yeah. you were you were getting you were getting gigs you were getting some work when you got there right well Guys yeah and, and the thing was like i had done so much stuff in miami that i had a little bit of a name to do clinics for yamaha and i had already i had just finished my first i got that book deal with sandy felstein at warner brothers yeah. So I was doing some press stuff for that. That book was coming out. And then um, they had asked me to do the DVD for that book, the drum set crash course. And then another book transitions that was like a follow up to that. And then they had come to me and asked me to produce and co-write the whole commandments of art and be drumming thing with Zorro. So basically I met Zorro out in LA and then we started that whole project. So between like, getting local gigs, doing some clinics, having all this stuff going on with back then, you know, I bought my house with an advance from one of those DVDs. I mean, that's when those, that yeah. stuff actually sold and, you know, was doing really well, but, yeah. you know, I, I was able to keep it functional until I got something going in LA, which was like the first thing that I did 
of consequence was the fifth dimension. But I did the same thing in LA that I did in Miami, which was go and get into the casual circuit first, because yeah. people don't know what that is. You know, it's weddings and bar mitzvahs and corporate events. And th- because what would happen is the offices back then would put bands together. They weren't set bands. They would go Saturday night, yeah. Cohen bar mitzvah, you know, eight yeah. piece band call three horns, drums, bass, blah, blah, blah. But what happens is in LA, you know, you'd look over and it was Bruce Conti from Tower of Powers on guitar. And, you know, Andrew Grouche is, you know, the MD for, or Don Wyatt or somebody's MD for Kenny Loggins is on, you know, piano and all these horn guys. So what would happen is you would start to meet all these guys. And if you did a great job, then they would start to recommend you. And then next thing you know, like, you know, I just did one that the MD for the fifth dimension was on. And he was like, man, I really want you to cover this gig. And, and then um, I, how actually ended up being involved with that and who was playing drums. And I had met him many years before. Uh, and then when I got to LA contacted him and talked to him uh, several times, and then he knew that MD and um I said, well, you know, I got a couple recommendations like Hal Blaine. <laughs> and he's like, wow, wait a minute, Hal Blaine, you know. So, you know, I pulled that string. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's you know, how it started. You've always, you, you've, and, and I, and I, you know, I know you know what I'm saying when I say this. You've always been able to, um, I mean, you're, you're a really, really smart guy. I was the first thing I noticed about you when you were, you had to be, I mean, 22 when I met you, maybe, or yeah, something like that. early 20s. And you were really, really just like head and shoulders above a lot of people that age in terms of just your, your business sense and reading the room. You know what I mean? Kind of like knowing the, the right people to get to know and, and getting from, from point A to point B in the most direct way. And so um, I, I, that was one of the first things that I, that I really liked about you is how you... Like at the time I met you, I remember you were doing clinics for Yamaha already. I think at that point you had a, a big, like when electronics were like a, a, a big thing, which they, they are now, but in a different way, as we know, but like yeah. you had augmented this, your kit with electronics and you had a sampler and you had the whole thing going on, you know, yeah. and like you were yeah, Wackel, ahead of that. Yeah. Weckle and I were way into that scene <laughs> when yeah, I, yeah. and I hadn't met him when I was that age too. And he was an influence on me and, but I kept in contact with him and, you know, now we've been friends for many years, but he's, he, you know, we talked a lot about that, about yeah. what was going on with electronics at that point. And yeah, I was way into it. I, ironically, it's funny. I think we were doing way more with electronics back then than drummers are now, to be yeah. honest. I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, now it's like, I see a guy with the octopad and he's got a hand clap and a, but back then, you know, we were triggering a lot. Um, Tony Verderosa, if you remember, I do. was like really cutting edge with stuff. You know, Akira Jimbo, not many people know, but Akira really saw what Tony was doing and took it to another place. But Tony was, I don't know if he was the originator of that, but he's certainly one of the very first that I ever saw putting on melodic things. And Yamaha had... And Cat, I was involved with Drum Cat with Mario, and the, but the original one. Yes. And yeah. and we, they had broken this sort of technology where MIDI notes would alternate when you hit a pad. So that was a big deal. Like you hit the pad before it was like one MIDI note, one sound, and then they came up where you could stack them. That made yes. so then we were able to make chords, and then he came up the thing where it would alternate every time you hit it would be a different note. So then you were able to make bass lines and. And that's when Tony and those guys, and we started to do that stuff. And that was actually, when I was still in Ohio, I had a drum cat. And one of the gigs that I had in Ohio was playing for the Akron Ballet. And I would go in with a drum cat and some percussion and they would, I would improvise whatever they wanted to practice in. So the, 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 the instructor would go, this is in 516 or this is in five, eight or seven, eight or in four or three. And I would have to come up with some piece of music in real time, like in improv like that with some melody and some percussion 
enough for them to be able to practice their dancing in those time signatures and different wow. things. And that was what I was doing, you know, after I left high school, before I went to college and all that. I was going to say, so you were a teenager, high school, just after high school, and you're, you're reading and you're, you know, your comprehension of different time signatures was that good then that you could. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I was way into yeah. it. Cause I, my school, you could, it was a vocational high school, but back then, lucky for me, you could major in music. So a lot of guys were doing like, you know, automotive repair or whatever. And I, I had music all day. So I, I had like composition and arranging and stage band and jazz band. And I was marching with the Canton Blue Coats drum corps and I was playing gigs at night and, you know, with the cover band and teaching at Zampino's drum shop, like all these kids, how to hold the sticks. And yeah. so I was playing and music. I mean, literally from eight in the morning till two in the morning, like every day, every single day, like hardcore, pretty yeah. hardcore. This is great though, man. I think this is important for people to, to hear this coming from you that this is, you know, these are the kinds of commitments you have to make to, yeah. to get to where you are, you know, it, it, and I know people know that, but I, it, I, I think it never hurts to remind people like you, you did that when you were 18 to going to school in Miami. And that was, did you get a degree in music in Miami? I, I, I went for studio music and jazz performance. I actually left before I graduated, but cause I was working so much and then I ended up going to LA, but, um, yeah, I, I didn't graduate with it because it was a performance major anyway. So at the end of the day, I was like, I just want to work in the business, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. I think you've, I think you've earned an honorary on that one, Russ. I think, <laughs> that, should, well, that should come in the mail any minute. Um, yeah, I got, I did get, I'm a, like a guest professor in three universities, actually. One in the Shanghai Conservatory, and one in Beijing. And, wow. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of. So, but anyway, well, Dave, yeah, Dave so, Maddox, Dave Maddox is watching and he said, no wonder he's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I love Dave. You're my favorite, man. Yeah. I just Dave. got your video, by the way. I just, he just did a video for GrooveX and he's awesome. He's, oh, fantastic. Great. Well, yeah, well, yeah, we're going to talk about that too. Um, but this is, this is great because, you know, again, just like all these things that we're talking about leading up to you moving out to LA and then, you know, paying your dues out there to where you you know, became one of the cats. Like you, you moved into a very coveted position in LA to, to play on big records. And, you know, when, when going into a studio was still a scene. Yeah. Um, but I, but I do remember, I want to say, gosh, it was probably in the mid two thousands. I came out to your house out in, um, I probably shouldn't say the town, but, um, Oh no. <laughs> It would have been probably Chatsworth back then. It, right? was, it was Chatsworth. You're right. Yeah, you're right, 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 right. Dave Weckl. We That's were like right. right down the street. Yeah. That's right. Are you in Granada Hills now? Or are you? No, I live in Porter Ranch now, Porter which Ranch. is. Okay. It's not far. It's just up the top of the hill. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I remember coming out, and you had you had the studio happening in the house, and um, and you were starting to work a lot at home when that whole thing was really just kind of starting to happen. Not a lot of guys had sort of embraced that yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. I built that studio in the early two thousands. I started to, and I, I bought that house and then we built, do you remember the studio was like a separate little building that was kind of yeah. on the property attached to it. But um, yeah, I mean, it's funny, Dave Weckl and I were talking around the beginning of the pandemic and, you know, it was like, yeah, my life doesn't look that much different. <laughs> You know, like, yeah. I mean, you know, I all the touring stuff stopped, but it was kind of like I pretty much hang out in the house working all the time anyway, you know, uh, but it was a super big blessing through the pandemic, you know, to have that because I was already very established doing yeah. that stuff with a lot of TV shows, especially and movie stuff, because the turnaround times were so fast that they really took to guys who had their own places because we could turn things like this you know versus yeah. oh hey we got to go into a studio and record the next 10 episodes all the drums and percussion and then bring that back and separate it and mix it and do all that. we could do one at a time without having to 
endure the expense of cartage every time and booking a studio every time, you know, all that kind of stuff. So movies and television really took to the home studio thing. Uh, and then records started to later. You know, so it, it's, it was a great business move for me. I'm not saying it is for everybody. Like Kenny and Aronoff and Kenny called me years ago and was like, you think I should build a studio? He didn't have one at the time. And I'm like, yeah, because you have the client list for it. Yeah. But it's not, you know, build a studio and they will come. Like, you know, right. some guys think like, if I just build this, I'll get all kinds of session session work. It's like, that's not really true. You got to have the clients to do you gotta it. Got to have the clients. Yeah. And I, I, but, you know, I th you're right, though, because, you know, Kenny's the kind of guy, too, that I think he really thrives on being in a room with people and, yeah. and that whole, um, you know, just a whole the interaction with what. But I know he's working a lot at home now, like you. He's yeah. he's he's embraced it. And a friend of mine in the first band I ever played in guitar player who lives in Dallas um, had Kenny put some drum tracks down for him. He, mm -hmm. he said, uh, he said, yeah, he was, he did a great job, did it really fast and he didn't charge me much money, much money. And I said, that's, that's the big problem that I've been yelling with <laughs> Kenny about. I'm like, stop <laughs> undercharging. People are like, well, I got Kenny to do it for this. And I'm like, yeah, I don't yeah. care what he charged you. This is what he, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, that's Kenny for you. No. Oh if, my gosh. If he's watching Kenny, we love you, but yeah. Charge more money, man. Put Come another on. zero on there, brother. <laughs> One more zero. That's all I'm asking for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my my friend was so happy. He said, "Yeah, you know, he, he got, you know, he did a great job. It was turned around quick and wasn't too expensive." So, yeah. anyway. <laughs> um, so, no, it's good. So, you know, in in, in the in during the course of all this time, um you've always had you've always been in as long as I've known you like ideas for designing stuff like you're you know like like dave like weckle too would always have like an idea for mm -hmm. a better mousetrap a better way of muffling the bass drum or or so so you started to bring these ideas to at the time yamaha and yeah. maybe you could talk about some of these these designs that became huge like yeah i mean staples. all of them are you know necessity is a mother of invention thing it's just I, I I always say the the cat you know when you see one when you see something and then the first thought is why didn't we do that before you know or why didn't that happen previously that that's when you have it because it may, that means it's simple and it's effective and it's fixing a problem yeah. or yeah. filling a hole but I none of them I never sat down and went I'm going to invent something you know I mean it was always kind of I would run into something like the groove wedge with Yamaha that ended up, you know, being really successful. And then of course we revamped it all for groove X, but right, I mean, right. that was just being on a session for Moulin Rouge and, and the movie. And, and I was using a 12 inch snare drum and they loved that drum and it was great, but the verses were all cross sticks. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, Oh shit. <laughs> like I can't <laughs> play a cross stick on a 12, you know, it's no. not. Yeah. So I was like taking a 14 and trying to mount it on the bass drum and like, you know, everything I could to like pull this off. And in my brain, I was like, man, I just, I need a piece of like a wood hoop or something that I can like stick onto this drum and play across it. And, and then I just went home and, and made it, you know, I, my grandfather was a journeyman machinist and, I would always hang out. I was kind of raised by him and, and he was a great music enthusiast. He got me into music and, and playing big band drumming first. I was playing big band and jazz before rock and rock music. And, and then I would sit around and make things with him and he would show me how to do carpentry stuff. And then I ended up getting very interested in it. And I, as a side thing, I took finished cabinet making and I took mechanical engineering like while I was, I had no intention of ever doing it for a living. And I'm like the opposite of every mechanical engineer in the world who made a living doing that and wanted to play drums on the side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Making a living playing drums and doing mechanical engineering as a hobby. But um, it totally ended up in the long run, I was able to like for Mapex now, I draw the blueprints for things and you know, yeah. it, even at Yamaha, I would draw up the designs and the blueprints and then I would hand make, I handmade the first sub kick, 
you know, and, and, and all that stuff to, to make a working prototype and then see if it worked and then take it to them and go, I really think we should try to do this. But, you know, there a lot of things have to be in place, right? You got to right. be in the situation to bring the idea. Then you got to be able to execute it. Then you got to be in a position where I was with Zildjian or Yamaha or Vic Firth, whoever, to bring it and go, hey, check this out. And yeah, yeah, you know, I think for you, Russ, I think a big part of it was exactly what you said. And I want, you know, I, I'll emphasize what you just said, because having seen it firsthand, you you would come with basically all the all the heavy lifting was done basically yeah. you know you you would present an idea and what i loved about it back when we worked together was you it it may sound simple to you but you would come with these ideas that like you you'd present an idea and i would think or john sorensen or anybody that was in the room like man like, why didn't I think of that? You know what I mean? It was like, you'd be like, well, yeah. man, I came up with this idea for this, for this brush, you know, this, this wire yeah. brush that can do this. It's like, yeah, that's a great, like, yeah. why, why, why didn't Adam Nussbaum think of that? No, right, right. <laughs> right. no, but, but I mean, those right. are, those are examples of like, you would, you would come up with something that was very, very practical. And so that's like step A or, you know, step one. And mm -hmm. then step two would be, you'd have it, you'd have a schematic pretty much done. Yeah, and yeah. and it would just be a question of executing it and and seeing you know yeah. is this going to actually work you know is this yeah and Hagi taught me years ago too what you know being at Yamaha with stuff was you know try to do things with pieces and parts that we already have because the um, the procurement smart. of those parts is a big part of it right. And obviously with Ruvex, I'm very aware of all that, you know, procuring pieces, parts from things to how do we actually make this? And, and there's a huge difference between making one and making 10,000 of something. It's a, there's a, like some people can like, I made this one thing, but it's like, yeah, but making 10,000 of them, it's a whole different thing. Yeah. So, but I remember when we did the bent bristle brush with Zildjian, yeah. Silgen brushes at the time. Yeah. I remember one of the things was I wanted the metal at the end so you could play the bells and things with the brushes and crash cymbals. And I remember bending, like taking a piece of them and like yes. bending it around the brush and going, Johnny's going to dig this, man. I don't want to scrap <laughs> this thing on here. And, you know, and I would, you know, show up with the thing like, yeah, almost done. And even, even, um, because I, I think we, we either had a signature stick with you or a stick that you designed, a, a you know, regular stick that yeah. I, I know you're with Vic now, but the same company, but, but I remember you had actually drawn the schematic for the stick as well. Yeah. Like, yeah. The, you know, the, the, you know, yeah. the dimensions for the, for the, the bead and the taper and the shoulder yeah. and, you know, and that's, that's a huge part of a company designing a stick is finding those kind of yeah. sweet spots for those, those measurements, you know, but you had that all figured out. Yeah. It, well, we started with the Zildjian stick before they bought Vic Firth. You remember we started with the, the, it had a little dot on the sweet spot where you played the cross stick, right? That's right. Yes. yes. And, and so I came in with the little dot on there and this is where it's going to be and blah, blah. And then when That's it, right. when they bought Vic, we just sort of converted it over. That was right when you were leaving, but then we sort of converted it over to the Vic Firth Extreme HD, which is my signature stick. It's been around for a long time. But and but I literally, not joking, literally took the Zildjian stick and went, I want more high mid definition on the symbol. And I sat with a grinding wheel and I shaped the tip of the stick <laughs> until it sounded the way I wanted it to. I believe and I took it in. <laughs> <laughs> and that and they could develop the tooling based on that tip that you settled on yeah right they yeah, did that's that saves so many steps you know and and yeah. like if 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 you were peter erskine and you said i i want something that's like this you know it could be three or four or five prototypes before they get to that point so right um yeah that's that's huge well, before i forget i was, I was just going to say i want to i I want to congratulate you. I know it's been a couple of months now, but you had an MD cover back in September. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I haven't, I'm embarrassed to say, but I'm glad I haven't read it yet because I, I wanted to have today be hopefully something very different than what MD has put in the magazine. So now that this is the MD podcast, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. it'll be kind of double the 
double the pleasure for all the MD readers and yeah. viewers. So. Yeah, that was cool. Congrats. That was very cool. Uh, and I, I was in Florida with, with Christine and Josephine, my wife and daughter. We were just on vacation and Carlos Guzman said, you know, I, I've known David Frangioni for many years, 20 some plus years since I was in Miami, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to his awesome museum that he's got there. Yeah. I don't know. If you, have you been down to that? I haven't. I, I have to check it out, though. No, I haven't. Pretty out of control. So you know, we've been friends for many years and, and it was fun to, I think he was freaking out that like he had all these crazy special drums, but I knew like every one of them. Where they were, <laughs> yeah, I'm a drum nerd. It is what it is. You know, <laughs> deal with it. And um, <laughs> so we, we hung and then, and we were talking about MD and, you know, I've been so involved with Modern Drummer over so many years, been in it many times, but never on the cover and, you know, wrote the column took over Roy Burns column and wrote that column for seven years almost. And, and then he was like, well, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. And, and we were talking, he's like, when's the last time you've been on the cover? And I go, <laughs> ironically, David, I've been on the cover of every magazine in the industry all over the world, except for modern drummer. <laughs> and he was like, what? You know, he just couldn't believe it. And um, so it was really fun. It was fun That's to great. do that. That's congratulations. And I'm, as soon as we're done with our show today, I'm going to read it. Okay. And, right. and, uh, and Sarah Hagen did the interview, which was Right. Fun. That's right. I saw that. Oh, that's great. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. We had a good time. That's awesome. So we've, we've talked about, um, I had made a note about your, about your book, um, drum set crash course. And, and there was a follow-up you said, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you because and I remember this as well, and I, I saw it on your website too that reminded me. The record you did with Giovanni, if you could just for a minute talk about how that collaboration sort of came to to, yeah. uh, to be with Giovanni Hidalgo, so people that are watching yeah. the world's greatest kunga player. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I love Gio. And, you know, we, we had known each other for a while and we had played together a few times in various places. And, um, we were having dinner one night and Paul Quinn, who's my attorney, who, yes. you know, uh, was like, you know, you guys need to do a record together, you know, cause I've had the label now for, I don't know how long, 20 some years. And we have 16 people on the label, 16 artists, um, all different. I mean, people like even Kirk Covington's, you know, Captain Kirk and the Devil Horns project, which is, he's, number 19 right now on the AC radio. I mean, it's unbelievable that he, he's had four top 40 hits and this new one is top 20. It's been in the top 20 for like four weeks. He's so, a talented. Yeah. It's local. just, yeah, it's really fun to see that happen because that gig is very earth, wind and fire, you know, all live horns. And, but anyway, um, you know, he was like, you should do it on the label and blah, blah. So Gio and I got together and talked, talked it through. And then I flew down to Criteria in Miami and I brought uh, Rike Pantoja, who's a superstar in Brazil, pianist that I worked for. I played on his albums, many, many albums, and he played on some of mine over the years. And he was in a very famous sort of the the yellow jackets of Brazil, a band called Cama de Gato. And, and uh, so he's very well known. And mm -hmm. so Gio was very excited that Rike was coming. And then Jerry Watts, who I, I'm sure you probably know, sure. bass player. Yeah. And then yeah. Richie Bravo came and made an appearance and we did some stuff together. And we basically were in at Criteria in Miami for like a week. And we just took everybody away from their lives and just went and made that record. And um it's pretty awesome. It's called Two Become One. And we had a kind of a hit song off it. It was a Beatles remake called Things We Said Today. It went to number 32 on CHR on Top 40 Radio, which that was kind of funny because it was like Megan the Stallion, Russ Miller and Giovanni Hidalgo, <laughs> like Cardi B. You know, we were like doing posts like with me and, you know, Cardi B fighting each other. But it, you know, so that and six bucks will get you a Starbucks coffee. But it was uh, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool to hear it on the radio and yeah, see man. it taken 
that you know in this day and age for it to do well but yeah it's a great re i love the record it's all live all live horns the vine street horns the phil collins horn section all those guys yeah. are on it and really killing and people can buy it from your website i know there's a, a yeah you can get it or, just, or download it yeah just yeah. download Apple, but, I, but, but to your point what's cool is that you know you've played on a million records big pop records you know that have grammy award winning multi-platinum <laughs> for other artists. So it had to be so cool that your own record is like charting, you know, in, in the billboard chart. It's like, it, it, yeah, oh, it's yeah. pretty much a trip. It was yeah. kind of a trip. Yeah. And to see, you know, like you said, like I've seen other people's names many times on billboard yeah. or whatever. And, but to see your name is like, wow, that's a trip, <laughs> you know, or, you know, for Grammy nominations or whatever, that, that it's actually you, you know, and yeah. not, you know, but, but Gio deserves all of those things. I mean, well, he's, he's, he does. And so he's do the you. buddy rich of Cungus. <laughs> he is the buddy rich of Cungus, but it probably gave you a lot of cred with your daughter too, with Joey. <laughs> it's funny. She was embarrassed because I would tell, I would go, daddy's songs number 32. Look, it's above Cardi B. And she's like, oh, that's just not right. <laughs> 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 like embarrassed, like, dad, don't tell anybody, dad. I'm like, oh, okay. man. I mean that you know what that it sums it. I'll, I'll tell you where it sums it up. Was like Steve called me Gad years ago and was like, "Can you teach Duke?" This Duke was younger, you know, yeah, like yeah. sixteen or whatever. He won't listen to anything that I say, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and I'm like that, that. Pretty much, and the same thing happened with Richie Garcia. He's like, "Can you teach Roland Garcia?" You know, Roland Roly. He he became like one of the top percussionists in the world now. Roland Garcia on Idol and does all yeah. the. Kanye West up and but at the time he was like can you teach Rolly he won't listen to anything you know and it, it just kind of sums it up it's like when when your dad is Steve Gadd and you still don't listen to him about drums <laughs> right. I mean it's kind of like nobody's dad is cool it just doesn't right yeah no yeah. I know he, Steve probably like just became exasperated by it like no Duke just yeah yeah and yeah Duke would come over and take lessons and and then I, the funny story is my daughter, Joey, we went, they had like the career day thing for your dad. And at the time I was doing American Idol and, and uh, we went in and her friend's dad works in the, for the sewer department, but in the big sewers where you walk underground in the huge tunnels, like you always yeah. see in the movies or whatever. And he was like, yeah, I work in the department of water and power. And I, under the sewer, you know, the everybody's like, whoa, that's so cool. And the tunnels. Yeah. And, and so I was up next and, and, and the teacher goes, no, Josephine, what does your dad do? And she goes, but nothing cool like that. He just plays drums on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, man, that's all I get. That's all I get. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, he, he was a tough act to follow. Come on. Yeah. Man. You know, yeah. It was, it was like, gets to wear the hat off. with the light on it. You know, yeah. that's oh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on down there. <laughs> oh man well we're going to come back to that question that anthony Cassina asked at the beginning but i just i don't want to forget um to talk about you know you made the move to mapex um mm -hmm. and i remember the year because it was you, you made that it was a huge move for you and in the industry and it was at the same time i left zildjian it was 2012 mm -hmm. that's right and and i remember you know not long after that not surprisingly things, you know, and Mapex was already kind of, you know, they were, they were definitely on the move, but you going over there really changed the face and the, and the look of the company. Wow. And so what, what are some of the products? Maybe you could just talk about some of the, the things that you helped bring to light there. Uh, well, Joe Hibbs brought me over and really, you know, to be honest, it was, I, I felt like I never really left Yamaha. They, they, they kind of left me like their whole thing changed. You know, I, Hagi left, they changed, they stopped doing things at Sakai in Japan, everything went to China. And, and it's not that they, they make bad products, they don't, but it was just, you know, you grew up with something, something you've been playing for 30 years. And all of a sudden it was completely different. Like they discontinued all of our signature products i mean even gad snare drums i mean everything you know every all of us i mean i we were all a little bit shocked so um it was a move that they had to make and i get it but at the time it was so dramatic for me that i you know and joe hibbs who i'd known for many years was at mapex and he said listen i have something really unique for you uh 
that I don't think exists anywhere else in the industry. And I'm, I'm like, okay. And he says, I, I got a leading drum brand without a flagship product. And because most brands are created from a flagship product and then they build downwards, you know, like take Sonor or something. Sonor sure. makes SP2, it's this incredible drum set. And then they make lines of drums that are more affordable that, you know, or whoever it is. At most every brand, and when we were kids, Brands only had one drum set. That's right, exactly. You know, exactly. That was it. They had one drum set at a time. Like the premier, you know, Royal Ace was like, that was it. We had that, you know, yeah. or it was yeah. like, the, you know, the Ludwig Classic. There wasn't 10 different lines of Ludwig. There was just Ludwig drums. That was it. Yeah. And and the same thing, even with Yamaha, it was like the recording custom was Yamaha drums. And then later on, when they started to release more affordable lines and the, and the industry started to do that. Everybody had different lines of drums and things, but when we were kids, there was just Gretsch had one drum set and, right. and, yeah. and so on and so forth. So Mapex had, because they were an OME, uh, OEM manufacturer, meaning they made a parts for a lot of other people. And a lot of people don't realize that the mother company for KHS that owns Mapex, they make a lot of people stuff, a lot of, you know, drum companies, hardware, a lot of stuff, racks for different companies. I mean, all kinds of things. They started this brand, but it had started with more affordable, inexpensive gear. So they never did what everybody else did, which was like, let's make this, you know, top of the line, incredible thing. And then like, come, it was like, they were going the other way. Yeah. So he was like, this is a really unique time for you to come in and be a part of designing what the flagship of Mapex was going to be. And I, I was like, wow, that's, that is true. Like where else are you going to do that? You can't go to DW. They, they've got their flagship thing, you know, or. Yeah. So yeah. it was really an interesting thing for me to be involved in, you know, some challenges, you know, because the instrument that I wanted wasn't there necessarily at the time. So, you know, Hibbs and I built custom things. We did all these things. And then we started working on stuff. And then of course he passed away and I, I sort of took that over, you know, for the company becoming like the, the lead R&D person. And so it really kicked into high gear, that thing. I, I did all the prototyping and we ended up, we made the Black Panther series, uh, the, the, the Design Lab Black Panther series, which is their high-end stuff. And we try to do all these really innovative things like magnetic tom mounts and just all these really pushing the envelope and it ended up bringing the whole line up to that flagship and and now saturn evolution and the new saturn and all the new black panther snares i mean look man mapex they they've got the best instrument for the money in the market bar none you, nobody can say that that anything but that yeah, yeah, i mean yeah, they yeah. they can make stuff at a really good price and i mean even like you know the signature snare drums you know the ones that we had before, or you see other companies, everybody's drums are 13, 14, $1,500 for these snare drums. And like, here we come with our signature snare drums are like $500, you know, and yeah. it's an opportunity for people to actually own the stuff, to be honest, you yeah. know, yeah. and, yeah. and Hibbs used to say that he's like, we're going to make something great and people are actually going to be able to buy it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I remember so, how excited he was when you, when you came on board and sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, You've made your presence felt, and and you know, and then I know our good friend Jeff Hamilton. You, you know, you got his attention basically because yeah. You know, he, well, he, great... I, you know, I look. We're all friends with all these guys, and I certainly would never call anybody and go, um, "Hey, you need to check this out and switch drum companies or blah blah blah." But when I started to work on the Cherry Bomb kit, which was for the Design Lab, it was all Cherry. And I literally went, okay, the, the one thing that we did with Mapex that's different than every other company is most other companies work with materials first. Like, hey, let's find this wood and let's make snare drums out of it. We'll see how they sound. And if it mm -hmm. sounds great, we'll make a couple of different models and we'll sell it. This was totally the opposite. Because we had so much to do. We, you can do that when you have all these other things, but when you're going, we don't have a drum set yet, <laughs> like yeah. not one, you know, like, yeah. so it's like, we, I, we went the other way. It was like, let's make a sound, let's come up with a sound and let's build that sound first. 
And then we'll build another sound and another sound and we'll work that around and then we'll, we'll build this line rather. So what we would do is not go, hey, let's make a copper snare drum. We'll make an eight, a six and a half, a five, a three and a half. Because the problem is not all of those drums are great drums. It only works if you have a ton, if you got 50 snare drums in your range, then okay, fine. You know, have all the different sizes and somebody might dig it and blah, blah, blah. But we only really had the opportunity to make one copper snare drum. So it was like, listen, what does that drum need to be for it to be great? Yeah. So I literally, not, not joking, would sit down with albums and go, okay, I know that's a metal drum. I know this is a steel drum. This is Stuart Copeland's snare from Walking on the Moon. This is John Henley's snare from, you know, uh, Long Run. This is, and, and I would try to like make those sounds and, and try to do that. And that's what we ended up doing with that. And it, it I think it, it really is effective why there's only 15 snares, but they're all great. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, I own a hundred and some odd snare drums. I mean, and, but some of those drums are some of the best ones that I own. And I mean, I got no BS, you know, I got radio Kings and black beauty. I got all that stuff, but yeah. some of them are really happening. And that was it. You know, that was the whole approach. So I, I think it's done really well. I know they're like the black Panther snares are doing extremely well and all that's doing well, but that was, it took a while, you know, to, to do yeah. that. I, I think what you just said is huge. It's so huge. Like the, the concept of, you know, building, you know, building what, what you, what people want, you know, basically in, in short, you know, not, not building what you can make, right. you know, what's easy to make. It's, yeah. it's, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, more people could, could learn from that kind of, you know, marketing strategy or, or product strategy, you know, it's. Yeah. And yeah, Mapex been really, I mean, I couldn't ask for anything more than what they've done as far as the freedom to do yeah, those things. Yeah. So, but anyway, to, to answer the Jeff Hamilton question, that was the long winded way of saying, I literally went, the small drums need to sound like Jeff Hamilton on <laughs> these records, you know, because to me, he was, he's got a modern 1950s sound. Like it's a 1950s Gretsch sound with calf skins, yeah, but yeah. hi-fi, you know, there's frequencies in his, in that that doesn't you we couldn't get back then because they were a little bit more tubby and muddy yeah and, and yeah. now there's more high-end presence and so i when i got done with the drums the cherry bomb kit i was like the big drums to me were the eagles drum sound the small drums were like a, a hamilton style drum sound and i i had to call him i go dude i i'm not listening I'm not the guy that calls and goes, yeah, check this out. Blah, blah, blah. But I'm telling you, I built this entire thing around your whole scene. <laughs> you got to check this out. And he's like, okay. You know, and he was totally blindsided by it. But I mean, he, he flipped, you know, he yeah, flipped yeah. when he heard it. Cause he was like, it sounds like, you know, exactly what we tried to do. So. I think that, you know, that's huge because Jeff is not someone that would just, you know, because of what you went through to do that would, would pay you lip service and go, okay, that's fine. You know, like it, you had to come through with the real deal with the real shit. And, and you yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was like calling me going, uh, hold on. Uh, I, I need a few more people to listen to this and then I'll get back to you. You know, <laughs> he yeah, would like yeah, ask yeah. John Clayton, like, check this out, you know, and Clayton <laughs> would be like, man, that's the shit, you know? And, and like these other, cause he couldn't even believe it, you know? And, and it was yeah, funny. Yeah. It was really funny, but I was super happy that he dug it obviously. And watching him play those drums, that, that's the cool thing about all that is seeing the sub kick on Vinnie Caliuta's drums and seeing, you know, the groove wedge on Sonny Emery's drums or, you know, whoever, and, or the groove X stuff, seeing, you know, Dave Maddox with a, an X click. And I mean, that's the fun part is seeing all those guys using this stuff and, yeah. you know, and going, wow, check that out. I, you know, Russ Conkle's playing, he's got a sub kick with James Taylor, you know, or yeah. whatever. And that's, they, they, that's fun. Yeah. They wouldn't, they wouldn't use it if it wasn't good. I mean, that's just, it's that simple, you know? It's yeah. Just, they 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 love you you're their friend but they wouldn't use it if it wasn't good you know no of course not yeah, yeah. and i finally got the staccato ride coming with zildjian this year fantastic that's great but, yeah that only took 30 years but <laughs> 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 I'm just joking. Uh, uh, 
they released it in the custom shop, but it did so well that they're going to put it in the catalog. That's great. It, it'll be out like next, like next year October, or later this year. October. October. Great. Yeah. Congratulations on that. Yeah. Thanks. That's, That's a fantastic. great instrument. I know Steve Smith loves it. He uses it on his left side and a bunch of guys really dug it. Marcus Gilmore and all those guys, but is it, uh, is it a 20 and a 22 or just a 20 or we just did the 21. 21 okay yeah it's a different bow and it's a flat ride with a crown that you can crash and that i i mean i went to paul francis at the time and said i want roy haynes's flat ride but you know yeah i gotta have a crown and yeah. and the crown is the same crown as a 17 inch crash i see yeah yeah so and one of the things about the crown for me was when you record if the crown a lot of times the crown is out of balance in cymbals they're too big, they're too loud, and they take over, mm -hmm. especially the stereo overhead mix or the room stereo mix. Like the crown gets out of balance in reference to the cymbal presentation. So my mix gets jacked up. You know, I can't control it. I found myself yeah. pulling off the crown a little bit. Like I didn't want to do that. I wanted the crown to sit in the correct present pre presentation as the rest of the ride. And and then the big thing for me was I I I, I crash the ride a lot. So I, I wanted to have that symbol react and, and be able to be, you can't crash a flat ride, you know, that, yeah, right. you know, work. So yeah. it took a lot. It took a lot of time, almost three years to do that. And we ended up doing a 21 inch uh, rarity symbol that Paul made for me. It was a K custom, a K custom thin, right? And it sounded beautiful, but you couldn't really crash it yet. So I, I said, listen, if we lave this thing and just keep working the metal, try to loosen it up, can I get this thing to crash? And and we finally did and changed the bow a little bit and then the crown size. And I mean, it's a really unique symbol, man. And it's hard to find something that Zildjian doesn't have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, After, you're right. I mean, yeah. They got yeah. a lot of shit, man. You yeah, know? So that's if, exactly right. It's It's when there's that much stuff already in the catalog to find something, to find a, a, a true sort of gap is, is hard to find. And yeah, it sounds yeah. like you have. Yeah, we did. We yeah. totally did. I stand by it, but it, but it took a while. It took a long time to do yeah. it, but I, I'm excited. It's, it's fun. It's great awesome. Well, I, I, before we, before we wrap it, I want to talk about your company too, um, yeah. GrooveX and, and, you know, some of the things you're doing, you mentioned the, the, you know, all the, the stick click and, yeah. Yeah. We, Groove X is, um, to be honest, you know, it's it's sort of uh, hearkening back to what we grew up with, with Vic and and Armand and Poggy and all those guys that started, you know, Remo Belly, you know, all that stuff started with just guys going, you know, I want to make a great instrument and that they pretty much wanted, you know, and then was excited that other drummers wanted it. And you know, the excitement of Lenny and Armin walking around with a cymbal bag and, you know, giving, check this out, buddy, you know, or yeah, whoever. And, you know, it was instrument first and uh, everything else second. That's hard to do on a grand scale. It's got to be a small company. Um, so I just, that's it. You know, I, I've been taking the designs that I had that patents are up on and, you know, getting either redoing those or doing a whole other design of things that I thought, hey, this was the, the holes that I saw in the first stuff. And mm -hmm. so we have the X click is, you know, the cross stick thing, a redesign, the mounts, really small body, just works incredible. Now it's copper and wood mixed together. And, and um, you know, we got 50 guys that are artists. I mean, it's like the dream artist lineup that every drum company in the world would want, you know, with all yeah. these it's like Erskine and, you know, Steve Smith and Hamilton, and it just goes on and on Ray Luzier and Matt Griner. I mean, just, and so it's been incredible. You know, we have about 19 products in line. We've only got two out now and the rest are coming, but we have the new magnetic sizzler thing. It's, it's a magnetic washer that puts beads and, and jingles on your symbols and, and the magnets hold them off the symbols if you don't want to use it. And great. So it's it's a whole series of stuff coming now that of tones that goes on the drums using magnets, taking them on and off, and things stack on your snares and toms and on the cymbals. And we have a, a new drum mat um, series coming out called the Extreme Mat, and it's a a whole nother surface of drum mat that's not a carpet, 
and it's completely flexible. You can change the shape and uh, it's got anchors in it now where the pedals will not move at all, period. The bass drum will not move and spiking stickers to mark all your stands and everything. And it comes apart and goes into a little case. So you don't have this big carpet to schlep around. And, How and much uh, weight, Russ? Do you know how much it weighs? It, it weighs uh, six pounds. Six pounds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, okay. And it's like 24 by 24 tiles kind of that you just put together and you mark them. And, and uh, Gavin Harrison worked with us on that. And um, Sammy Marandino worked with us on the magnetic sizzle thing. You can't find any good drummers to help you. It sounds like all the B guys. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> man uh, yeah we got wow. a lot of stuff coming so it's fun it's really fun and and um i have a new company called Hitcore, and uh, i'm in the building for that now and that's an online events company that launches in june and and it's a it's sort of a netflix for live concerts and um i'm the ceo of it but we have a board of investors a lot of guys that you know actually and uh, we have a 20,000 square foot facility. I've, I've been working on the software for four years with a team in Germany. And Florian is involved with that team in Germany. And we have a proprietary software that allows people to watch live shows and select anything they want to see. So you can go into the virtual reality camera and look around the sound stage, pinch and zoom into Gad. Let's say Gad's playing, you can zoom into the drums and just watch him or just watch the guitar or just watch overhead my or drum cam. Or, you know, you can create a whole experience that's just for you. And uh, when it goes into archive, you can do the same thing and subscribe and you can keep watching them and change the way you see the show every single time. And uh, it's pretty cool. It's really cool. So I've been working on it for four years and we have this huge facility now. I moved the studio here and out in Simi Valley, uh, we got a 6,000 square foot sound stage with 35 foot lighting trusses and 60 foot walls. And just, it's amazing. Congratulations on that. That's, that sounds unbelievable. And that, that's going to be up in June. June. Yeah. It's, it's called hit or H I T K O R. Okay. And um, you'll see it. It's like a global branding campaign. It'll, it'll show up here soon. We, we haven't started the marketing yet because you know, you don't want to do it too soon because people yeah. forget about it. Forget about it. Yeah. But you know, we're, you know, we're definitely going to come back you and I, and, and when some of these things start to happen and, and have you talk about them, we'd yeah. love to do that. Oh no. Yeah. And you got to come out you'll flip out when you see it. Really, yeah. really cool. That's great. I, I want to read you a couple of quick comments to uh, yeah. our friend Mark Pusey watching from London. I'm oh, assuming yeah. Mark's in London. Got to say the X click is a godsend in caps. Nice. So <laughs> many drum inventions um, try to reinvent the wheel, but that is a product that actually finds a great solution to a problem and nails it. Yeah. Mark's yeah. a great drummer doing Ed Sheeran's gig, right? He, he is doing Ed Sheeran's gig. He, yeah. he works a ton in London. Great yeah. drummer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and he's officially yeah, well, the, the best looking drummer in London too. Mark Pusey. <laughs> well, some, you know, I've been doing it in LA for so long. Somebody's got to do it over there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, that's congratulations for us on all these, all these great, I oh, mean, thanks. you know, you never stop. It's, it's. Yeah, we're going at it. I, we just filmed um, a new Blu-ray concert with a rival, my touring band with Rick, Rick Creevy and Jerry Watts and and um, we have a new record coming out and that record was totally fun and you'll appreciate this because it's a it's called Soul Mind and Body and it's it's all covers that influenced me over my career but that we did new arrangements of so it's three trios one trio is me and Tony Monaco I mean, you know Tony from Steve's band the yeah. great B three player from Ohio actually. And Ernie Watts. So Ernie Watts, Tony Monaco, and I, that's one trio. Wow. And that's like more of a straight ahead swing thing. And then the other trio is myself and Kirk Covington singing and playing B3. And Pee Wee Hill, who's the, I met with Rufus, you know, the bass player from Rufus. And Ellis Hall sang on that. You know, oh, Ellis. Yes. I do. Yeah. And that's all R&B stuff. And then we have the other trio, which is Jerry Watts and Rick Creevy and I, which is the one we normally tour with. And then Stephanie Spurl, who's one of the great 
session singer. She sang on everything from Michael Jackson to Luther Vandross to everything. She's singing on that. And we have a bunch of new tunes. And then we shot a new live Blu-ray at Hitcore for it. And that, that's coming um, in August. Wow. And uh, so and other than that, I've just been hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And today you have a dance recital for your daughter. So I yeah, really gotta... appreciate you taking some time to do this. And that's, no, that's no, awesome, no. man. That, thank you. And I want to just put your new drum room, room, by the way, man, it looks dope. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. Well, I, I hope you can make a trip out here sometime and, and see it in person. I, yeah, um, you long. I got lots of drums in the other room too. This is the, this is kind of where I hang out and do my playing, but I got a stupid number of drums set up in the other room that yeah i'm familiar and you got a right handy over there too i see the i got a righty for when you come visit i do okay I, I, I'm, all right and all the other kits in the other room are set up righty i just you know i i know i'm the, i know that i'm the one with the problem not right-handed drummers so <laughs> okay. all right well all i know is you know i just went through a whole thing with steve smith about we call it gong jazz and uh, he's he's got his gong set up. He was at Birdland playing all these swing things on the gong, you know, and uh, I see you got to get the gong set up there and you got to call Steve and show him that you're working on your gong jazz chops. I will. I'll do that yeah. now that I know yeah. that. Yeah. Hey, Steve, yeah. check this out. I'll do a little. Yeah, we do FaceTime sometimes and I'll do a little little swing beat on my gong. Well, next time you do it, tell him I told you that, you know, I will. you got to get your gong jazz chops together. <laughs> It's a great rock band uh, name. That is good. That's good. Well, I want to come back to Anthony's um, quick question. He said, could yeah. you talk about changing where the pulse is developed from your hands and feet to more internally and mentally? Is that, I don't know if that's a, that's yeah, a, long... It's, a long, it's a long one, but you know, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story of where that came from with me. I was studying with Freddie Gruber at the time and Freddie told me the story about when Buddy broke his wrist. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. think in his karate class or something. It was, yeah. And then he borrowed the other bass drum from Louis Belson, and he had a run with the band, and he didn't want the band to be out of work because he had broke his wrist. So he borrowed one of Louis's bass drums, and he did this run. And there was supposedly there's a video on YouTube of Buddy with the doing solos with the two kick drums. Okay. And uh, he had never played two bass drums before, right? Right. And uh, I have to ask Kathy about it too, but he was telling me the story and the way he referred to it was that, you know, if you had internalized the pulse and the rhythm previous to the execution of it with your hands and feet, if it was all coming from in here and here, that this was only executing what was already internal, then you could do that. You could take something he obviously had facility with his left foot from playing the hi-hat and but the rhythm was in his body it wasn't mm -hmm. out here and and right. one of the things that i see a lot is a lot of drummers try to manifest groove and pulse out here that's not where it exists at it exists in here and this is just executing it and that's where you see people speed up and slow down a lot because mm -hmm your body's not going to want to do it perfectly. It's going to go, Hey, wait a minute. That's hard. You know, and it's going to yeah, slow yeah. down or, and, th and that's where a lot of the time issues come from is, is that you're manifesting it out here and not internally. If you hear and this is, you know, I got a little bit from dad too talking to him about it, where it was like, he was, he could hear it happen out. He was thinking it. And then I was listening back to make sure that my hands and feet were doing what I was expecting them to do versus listening to see if they did what I wanted them to do. Yeah. There's a big yeah. difference in that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And that, that, that was something that really changed my playing was me being able to go, here's a 16th note pulse at this tempo, whatever it is. And then I'm listening back. And if you listen to Steve's playing, he's a great example. If he establishes a 16th note flow, it's a beautiful, relaxed 16th note flow through everything that he's doing. And it just kind of goes. And even if he plays a solo or a fill or he comes back to the group, it's all there because his focus is internally hearing and making sure that his body is producing what he's expecting it to, not seeing if it produces, but expecting it to produce it. Yeah. 
And that yeah. changed the way that I thought about that. That's, that's a great answer. That's a really great answer. And it's a, it's a, a great way for people to work on that to, yeah. you know, to, to develop that internal mechanism versus external. Yeah. And I think that's why a lot of people would say, Oh, record yourself and listen back to see if it sounds like that. But yeah. if you're doing that, you'll know that it sounds like that without having to listen back to it. Right. And then like, what would happen is I'd be tracking things in a studio and I, and I would stop and go, Oh, roll it back. You know, before they did, like I knew that that didn't work or I made a mistake before anybody else had to tell me that like I, mm. because it didn't happen the way I was hearing it inside. Yeah. And so those, those things I think change, change what the way you approach some, some things. And it's important because the drums are so physical that we have generations of guys now that um, take that path. Cause that's a much easier path. The physical path is much easier. It's like you're a runner, right? You can run how far now each day? 10 miles? Not anymore, but yes. I used to. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the first day you yeah. couldn't run 10 miles and now you can because you, yeah. you know, but that's the physical thing about drums is a lot of people let them take, take it over. They, the physical thing takes them over because to be honest, it's easier. It's, it's easier than the conceptual part. That's that's a that's a perfect answer. It's a perfect way to to kind of sum that up. In fact, Anthony said, "Great answer, Russ." So, all right, thanks. <laughs> all right, Anthony. it's a good question, man. Thank you. Yeah, it was. It was. He, he always asked good questions. Yeah. Well, Russ, thank you so much. This has been great. This is and and thanks for taking some time out today to. Oh man, my answer. pleasure. It's great to see you. It's great to see you too. And I and I so hope we can see each other in person. I you know I, I. I had thought about trying to come up for the NAMM show. I don't know if you're going to be even be in town in June, but um, they're having it the first weekend of June. But now it looks like I'm, my band is working on June 1st and June 4th. Wow. Um, so I'm going to be- I, I was trying to figure out whether to go to that. I don't know what's, it's all so different now. <laughs> I know, I know. And, and there's that part of it too, that, that do you even want to, you know, not to-, to shoot a hole in them, but I mean, do you even want to put yourself in that situation? Maybe, maybe it'll all be fine. I don't know, but yeah, I, we'll see. It's going to feel really odd that it's not like in January. And, yeah. You yeah. know, I went to, I don't know how I'm like you 30 of them in a row or something crazy amount. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, hopefully we can please come in and see the place and um, get over there. Tell Kelly and everybody, I said, Hey, I sure will. I will. Yeah. And, and my love to Christine too, from us and yeah. And, and Joey, who I remember as a baby, who's now, you know, a teenager, you know? Yes. Yeah. Going on 30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friend. Well, thank you again so much. Hang out for one second. I'll end the uh, live broadcast and we'll say goodbye in the, uh, okay. in the green room. But All everybody right. watching, thanks for tuning in. Big hand for Russ Miller. Bye everybody. Thanks again, Russ. And tune in uh, Wednesday. My guest will be, Tommy Igo. Oh, very nice. Uh, yeah. Tell him I said, hey. I will tell him you said, hey. All right. All right. Hang tight for one second, Russ. Thanks again, right. everybody. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Okay. Awesome, buddy. All right.